Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Don Albright, and with my co-host Dan Deffenbaugh. Dan, you can turn your uh, mic and speaker on. Um, please, uh, to all the um, attendees, please identify yourselves and put your Masonic affiliation in the chat window at this time. I just promoted uh, Mike as a panelist so that uh, we can see his shiny face. Um, be aware of your mic and your video buttons located at the bottom of the screen, bottom left. You may be asked to unmute or, and turn your camera on when you ask questions. Uh, you may post questions in the Q&A. One thing that I may do toward the end of the pre or at the end of the presentation, I may just promote all the attendees to panelists so that anybody can turn on their mic and turn on their cameras so that we get to see everybody and, and not just see what they write. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce Dan Deffenbaugh, 32nd degree KCCH of the Hastings Valley. Tonight, his program is entitled Myth, Symbol, and Ritual, an Introduction to Each. Uh, Dan, the, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Don. I just saw uh, I think it was John Williams who said he couldn't hear us. Does anyone else have that problem? I hope not. Um, I'm going to share my screen here in just a minute. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm glad you were able to join us uh, tonight. Uh, I wanted to talk about something that uh, is really just a kind of a standard uh, standard lecture in any religion class I've ever taught. Uh, you know, a lot of people think if, if I teach religion that I'm teaching dogma, but in fact, that's that's really not the case. I'm teaching about world religions and the way they use various uh, practices like myth, symbol, uh, ritual, and and the similarities among those. So tonight I'd like to talk about that and also give you, a, I guess, an introduction to uh, how we might be able to look at myth, symbol, and ritual in masonry and, and what the connections are. And more importantly, what are the differences? Because a lot of times people will say, you know, well, masonry is like another religion, Freemasonry is like another religion. And I think, you know, by the end of our, uh, our presentation this evening, I'll, I'll try to give some reasons why uh, that claim is, is not valid. Uh, so um, if you have any questions, I hope you will write those in the, um, uh, not the chat, but in the question uh, box there, and I'll try to answer those as we go. But uh, I, I'd like to start with myth, and I'd like to start first of all with what myth is not. Uh, we often hear people talk about urban myths, for example, uh, about, uh, you know, you probably a famous urban myth is like uh, people were, would buy baby crocodiles. When they got too big, they would throw them into the sewers. And so the sewers of Miami are filled with uh, alligators or crocodiles, th that kind of thing that, you know, a, a story that's really not true. But what I want to say this evening is that a myth is, you know, contrary to a story that's not true. It is a story that is perpetually true. Uh, it is a story whose meaning and depth of meaning uh, transcends any type of dogmatic expression uh, of that. Uh, for example, the story of Adam and Eve. Now people, many of my students would very, get very upset when I say, well, this is a myth. And what I mean by that is that it is a tale that uh, gives us a symbolic insight into human nature. You know, it, it's a story that is, is told, but can be told in just about every context around the world. It's something about human beings. When asked not to do something, what is the first thing a human being is going to do? With just our natural curiosity. Well, I think I, I'll eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
that's what I mean about a mythic tale, a tale whose, uh, whose truth is, is hyperbolic. We can find it pretty much everywhere in every uh, context. So the, the, the study of mythology really uh, kind of came into his own. Um, well, there are a number of places we could start, but I would like to start with a psychologist by the name of Carl Jung. Uh, and if you have watched any of Joseph Campbell's, uh, or I should say Bill Moyer's series on, on Joseph Campbell, you'll know a little about, about Carl, Carl Jung. But Carl Jung was a protege of Sigmund Freud. And Sigmund Freud was a, uh, a psychologist who believed that all of our experiences get imprinted on our brains, right, in our experience. And then when we dream, what we do is those experiences get jumbled up and come out in ways that are almost um, you know, nonsensical. But the point that Freud wanted to make was this, that we cannot dream about anything unless we have experienced it in our lives. And Carl Jung wanted to oppose that. Carl Jung believed that all of us as human beings, it doesn't matter if we're talking about Papua New Guinea we're talking about South America, we're talking about Canada, where we're talking about you know, the Middle East. All of us as human beings are born with this uh, collection of images, what he calls archetypes. They are held deep within us in something called our collective unconscious. And these archetypes uh, help us as human beings to understand and make meaning out of our world. There are very famous archetypes, I'll be talking about one of them, but the archetype of mother and child, the archetype of the stranger, you know, how is it that children know to be, you know, afraid of strangers? Well, Carl Jung says there's an, this archetypal image in our collective unconscious that is almost like an instinct that uh, children identify with someone they see as a stranger and they know to be wary or they know to be suspicious of that stranger. Well, one of the archetypes that you'll probably best know about is, uh, and, and there are many of them, I could, could go on and on about these, but Carl Jung says that there are so many of these archetypes and we know that all human beings possess those in this place called the collective unconscious because if we look at some of the tales, some of the legends, the stories, the myths that are told around the world, we can see the same images coming up again and again and again. Classic example of this is the archetypal myth called the hero's journey. Uh, it is a, a tale that um, you probably all know. It, it's one that is you know, seen in movies throughout the world, uh, but it was also seen in Greek mythology. For example, uh, the story of Theseus. If you remember your Greek mythology, I'll just go over this very briefly, but Theseus was a young man who was born uh, to a mother, did not know who his father was, but when he reaches an age of accountability, uh, his mother, uh, Theseus, receives a sword nice phallic imagery there, you know, today I am a man, receives a sword and goes off on an adventure in search of the father, right? He meets up with people along the way, but eventually he comes to Athens where he recognizes, where actually he's recognized as the son of the king of Athens. In order to prove himself, Theseus goes over to the island of Crete. And while he's at the island of Crete, uh, in order to... Uh, remove Athens from a debt that is owed to Athens, uh, to the Cretans, he is chosen to go into something called a labyrinth. That's the picture we have right here. A labyrinth that at the center uh, houses this horrid minotaur, basically a bull man, a half animal, half human being. Nobody can come out of this alive. Well, Theseus does. He goes into the, uh, the labyrinth guided by a uh, thread that a young woman named Ariadne gives him, fights the Minotaur, comes out alive, and then is able to bring salvation to the people of Athens, in, in returning to Athens. Um, 
And what Carl Jung, and then somebody else who, who tries to explain Jung, a guy named Joseph Campbell says about this, is that, that this story of venturing out, meeting up with um, difficulties, meeting up with challenges, and then finally coming into a life and death encounter, overcoming that encounter, and then so-called rise from the dead, so to speak, and then able to bring back some secret knowledge or sacred knowledge to the place from whence he came, that follows an archetypal pattern. So we can see these, we can look at Native American stories. We can look at uh, the story of Christianity. We can look at uh, mythic tales that are, are seen in movies throughout the world. Think about um, Star Wars. You know, if you know Luke Skywalker in search of the father, right? He goes out and, and has to encounter, um, you know, his nemesis and comes back uh, a, a man as a result of it. Uh, think about the story of Frodo, Frodo Baggins and, and the Lord of the Rings, if you know that. These stories are told all over the world. They're called mythic narratives, archetypal tales. Begins with an individual who's called to an adventure. Sometimes he meets a mentor, but at some point he crosses a threshold. He's no longer in his home territory. He's out in a place he's never been before. He comes up against trials and sometimes failures and he grows in the midst of that. But eventually he comes, the hero comes to a point of whether symbolic or actual death and rebirth. And that death and rebirth uh, experience gives him a new revelation about what the world is all about and who he is in that world. Uh, gets him a sense of atonement. You know, he, he no longer feels a sense of uh, being lost uh, in the world, but somehow at one at atonement, at one moment with the world. Uh, sometimes he receives a gift and he's returned to the place from whence he came and bring salvation to the people uh, that he, um, uh, he left in the first place. So the story is told whether we're looking at the Lord of the Rings or whether we're looking at Jesus of Nazareth here. This is a medieval um, folio of Jesus doing something called the harrowing of hell. Jesus descends into hell, fights Satan according to the, you know, the tradition, and is able to bring all of the saints out of the clutches of Satan. Classic hero's journey tale. Uh, if you're more interested in this, and I'm, I'm giving just a very cursory overview of this, but to summarize, a myth is a narrative that's told that has universal meaning. And when the tale is told, people are able to get some sense of who they are as human beings, what makes the world meaningful for them, and what gives them a sense of purpose. But of course, in order to feel a sense of purpose in, in light of this myth, you have to be able to participate in that myth somehow. So think of it this way. A myth is a pair of lenses, a tale, a narrative, that's told that when we place those upon our collective you know, faces, the world comes clearly into view. I understand what's meaningful in this world. I understand that being a human being, I'm not just you know, uh, food for worms, but I have a sense of purpose in my life. Um, and I hope you know, when it comes time for questions and answers, we can talk a little bit more about this, but there are many myths and I wanna talk a little bit about those. Um, but another term that I want to make sure that we're aware of, and Tom Howard talked about this last week, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the term is symbol. What exactly is a symbol? Uh, one way to, to explain a symbol is to compare it to what it's often compared to, and that is at, to a sign. Uh, a sign is any object that's meant to convey information. The object can be arbitrary, it can be easily replaced uh, without challenging any sense of existential meaning, right? For example, uh, if tomorrow there was an international decree that went out 
that said to, that next year, we're all gonna start using stop signs that were fluorescent pink and a trapezoidal shape, there would be no great outcry about this. People would find it, well, that's rather inconvenient, inconvenient, but you know, I'm not gonna get too invested in this. You know, the sign that means stop can be on an octagon and it can be red and can easily be transferred to a trapezoid that's pink. Nobody cares if people make that, that change. So these objects that convey mean, uh, that convey information, I don't wanna say meaning, they convey information that are very arbitrary. If you try to change those, nobody has a problem with it really, or they'll feel you know, maybe a little bit put out by it, but they're, they're, it's not going to, to shake them at the core. But try to change or challenge any of these. Certainly these have a sign quality to it, right? They convey some information, but so much more. This is a symbol. A symbol is something that participates in the reality to which it points. Now you can look at this American flag and you know that it is more than just red, white, and blue with some stars on it. In fact, it is so multi-dynamic in its meaning that I'm sure every single person looking at this symbol uh, has uh, their own sense of, of what that means. That symbol participates in a larger narrative that we know as a national narrative, one that we all share. Now the problem comes when there's a conflict in narratives, right? We've seen the, the difficulty that people have had when uh, people wanna retain the, the stars and bars, the Confederate flag, right? Or this, this statue of Robert E. Lee. You know, these are more than just uh, inanimate objects, right? Uh, to take down the stars and bars, the, the Confederate flag from the Alabama courthouse means that you are dismantling an entire meaningful mythic structure in which people find meaning for themselves. You are dismantling a, a person's identity. Uh, same thing with the, uh, the uh, image of Robert E. Lee here, the statue on the horse. You take that down, you destroy it. You're not just destroying an inanimate, an, inanimate object that is, you know, conveying some sort of, you know, arbitrary information. You are dismantling, you're challenging a narrative that gives meaning uh, to people in their world. The flag is a perfect example of a symbol. Um, think of all the meanings that are, are attributed to this. And as I'll read here, symbols do not simply convey information but they participate in the reality to which they point. As such, they are a living embodiment of the myth that is the bedrock of a culture's values and its reason for being. Symbols are the presence of the eternal and meaningful amidst the temporal and the mundane. A symbol is that connecting place where the eternal and the temporal come together and gives us an entree into a realm that transcends our present, our present realm. Um, and it becomes a, a living representation of the myth narrative itself. Think of all of the, uh, the dynamics that go behind uh, this symbol that we were just talking about, the American flag. Whether you know it or not, when you look at that, your mind, you might even say your soul is, uh, is excited, <laughs> maybe, that's really not the right word, but it evokes so much. There's a narrative in that that you might not even be aware of. Here's George Washington, you know, getting together with Betsy Ross, who, you know, hours of work puts together the new flag for the colonies, you know, the inception of something that is brand new in the world. Uh, the, the symbol of democracy, uh, the white of purity, the red of valor, the, the blue that is uh, the, the blue and the stars that 
suggests the 13 colonies. There's something about this flag that even in its inception transcends just this temporal realm. Think about all of the feelings that go into your perception of these images. The flag at Iwo Jima, um, a veteran saluting the flag at Veterans Day. You know, to that man down there in the left corner, the flag is not just an inanimate sign conveying information. It is a, a means by which he can transcend his world and become part of a greater, more meaningful reality. And I know all of you must have felt this at some point. Uh, the one that's so powerful for, for me is this iconic image of the flag being raised at, um, at the World Trade Centers. Death and resurrection in the midst of destruction, the hope that comes with this flag, you know, this symbol uh, persists. Um, so a symbol is not just an inanimate object. If it were, you would not feel a sense of disgust, a sense of, you know, um, hatred maybe, or, or betrayal upon watching this symbol burn. Uh, people get very upset about this. Burning a flag means completely undermining somebody's mythic narrative and thus undermining their cosmic identity. I heard a, an NPR story not long ago uh, where a man was trying to defend, you know, the Confederate flag. And he, he said, you know, to the radio announcer, you know, I don't know why people are just getting so upset. If they can get so upset over an inanimate object like this, then they really got better things they need to be worried about. Well, he, he doesn't quite understand what he's talking about there because if you went and burned that inanimate object in his face, he it would not be inanimate anymore. It would be completely animated, right? So you know, these symbols are very powerful. Now, we're not even talking about religious symbols here. They can be just as powerful as well. So, um, so what about ritual then? So we have myth, we have the lenses that help us see meaning in the world through which we interpret the world as meaningful, as cosmically ordered, as uh, infused with the sacred, you might say. Then we have symbols which pretty much concentrate all of that mythic narrative into a, uh, a, a sacred item. It could be the cross, it could be the, uh, the crescent moon and star of Islam, it could be the star of David, it could be American flag. And interestingly, it, it's even, you know, uh, something as abhorrent to some as the, uh, as the Confederate flag, right? These are symbols that simply concentrate. You know, think about you know getting orange juice and concentrate. You add water. Well, these 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 symbols are concentrated narrative myths, uh, and they carry a lot of power. But remember, what people want to do is they want to participate. They want to be assured that they are part of that narrative. They are part of that story. So the way that that happens, and it usually happens around some sort of symbolic um, uh, marker of some sort, is that rituals are devised so that people can participate in the original myth in a way and thus transcend their own ra uh, reality. So a ritual then is a reenactment of myth that allows participants through their active involvement to set aside the temporal and the mundane and coexist for a while, cooperate with the gods or the founders of a culture. And this is not just a memorialization. You know, we do this to kind of remember what happened, but it's actually a recreation working alongside the cosmic creators so that you become one in that creation. And it's typically done um, and seen most clearly in creation myths among uh, indigenous peoples, for example, the Pueblo Indians, I think this is the Hopi here, 
every year, usually at the equinox for some cultures or at a, one of the solstices, a new year begins. But in order for that new year to begin in an ordered fashion, people have to participate in a recreation of the original creation myth. So basically every year at a new year ritual, the world is created anew by these very people who are participating uh, in that myth. Um, when they don these outfits, and oftentimes uh, they will have masks. There's a, a group known as the Zuni, another Pueblo group who, who, who dance with these masks. The idea is they place this mask over their face and they become those cosmic beings themselves. They are no longer just temporal human beings. They are charged with recreating the world and making it a safe uh, and beautiful place in which, in which to live. Uh, and you can see this in a variety of the world's uh, religions, this idea of recreation. But ritual is the means by which human beings can participate in the mythic narratives that make their lives so meaningful. And in, in many ways become co-operators, cooperative with the gods who, are, uh, who originally uh, experienced or participated in the myth. So what about Freemasonry? And I, I certainly don't wanna to spend too much more time because I wanna hear what everybody has to say about this. Um, if you've read this book by John Dickey, it's called The Craft, but at the, um, the, the subtitle is really important. How Freemasons made the modern world. What does he mean or what do we mean by the modern world? Well, part of the movement away from, um, let's say the Middle Ages through the Renaissance and into the modern world was trying to put aside an emphasis upon myth and emphasizing instead the use of empirical human reason. This is, this is what accompanies the, the rise of science or actually gives, gives rise to science itself. You know, don't tell me how the gods made the world and you know, I, I don't wanna get involved in all of this very, very symbolic understanding of how the world operates. I wanna know how matter in motion creates my experience here. And so the emphasis came to be on reason. And when we look at some of our rituals uh, themselves, reason is primary, right? Um, we, we emphasize the rational faculties of human beings to choose their moral path, you know, according to uh, the, the grand architecture of the universe, of course, and of the grand architect itself. But any type of emphasis upon um, imposing some sort of mythic understanding on someone is, is really eschewed. It's, uh, uh, you know, we've had enough of that. I mean, think about when Freemasonry begins in 1717. What was happening at that time? Well, a lot of people were trying to get away from this whole mythic idea of the divine right of kings right? Uh, human beings have rights, you know, they ought to be able to express themselves and use their own reason instead of having to kowtow to what our, our myths tell us about kings and how they are divinely chosen. So masonry is really a curious case because on the one hand, it really espouses a lot of enlightenment principles. But on the other hand, it recognizes the importance of myth symbol and ritual. Uh, those who created the third, our, our third degree, the master's degree, for example, um, rely upon a tale that has mythic origins. Now, we know there's no historical reference to a Hiram Abiff, uh, who is the, you know, the grand master uh, building uh, the temple, but we can symbolically see uh, how his character, how his experience, how his death and resurrection, symbolic resurrection, are important to, to masonry itself. So 
even though masonry begins in the heart of enlightenment, that's trying to, you know, stay as far away from what people see as kind of superstitious uh, uh, mythic uh, character and rituals, those who create our rituals still understand the importance of narrative, of mythic narrative. In order for people to understand who they are and what makes their lives meaningful, they have to place themselves into a story. And that story is going to have uh, artifacts that are going to connect them to the larger myth, the symbols that we talk about, what are they are the, uh, the, the, the compass and square or the, uh, uh, the perfect Ashler or, or the, uh, you know, any, any number of the symbols that we use. Um, so Freemasonry does this nice little balancing act doesn't get too mythically oriented, still emphasizes the importance of the autonomy of human reason, but also recognizes, if I can use a kind of an outdated image here, that human beings are both left brain and right brain. Right brain is the intuitive mythic uh, side. The left brain is the more reasoned, uh, rational uh, side of things. Uh, so we at once affirm enlightenment principles as well as uh, mythic uh, principles. Um, and we provide ritual. Uh, our ritual is the means by which we can reenact and relive the original myth itself. But here's the clincher. And here's the place where I hope we have a little conversation. Uh, Carl Jung in his book, Memor Memories, Dreams and Reflections said, Myth, let me change this so you can read it here. Myth is the revelation of divine life in man. It is not we who invent myth, rather it speaks to us as a word of God. So what Carl Jung is saying here is that myths cannot be simply created. You can't, you can't just kind of make one up, hey, let's do this and let's kind of create this fun ritual. Uh, they have to rise up out of a, a communal cultural experience and they they change over time but over geologic time not so much like from day to day so this raises the question what is the masonic myth there is an amalgam of stories it seems we borrow from the enlightenment you know and all of the tools of science and reason that are so important to us but we also uphold biblical heroes. The, uh, um, the story of Hiram Abiff is, is nothing more than another hero's journey. You know, encountering difficulty, he dies yet is resurrected and in that light is brought to the world. He, a memorial is made to him, a secret word. Um, and so, you know, myth that is created is questionable is what Carl Jung is trying to say. So the question I would ask, is the Masonic myth, the narrative that's so important to our fraternity, is it an archetypal myth? Is it something that wells up from the collective unconscious or is it contrived? Uh, and I would suggest we see more contrivance here than true mythology. Are we using symbols or are we using signs? Remember a symbol is something that participates in a larger, you know, a trans transcendent reality. A sign is something that, that conveys information that can easily be uh, changed. Um, somewhere in the middle there, we are somewhere between myth and, uh, and science, between myth and reason. Which raises the question, is Masonry, Freemasonry, is that a religion? And I would say, no, it is not, because it does not possess all of the initial foundational qualities of any religion. And that is to have a universal mythology with symbols for which, you know, that, that provide an entree into that tr transcendent realm. And the ritual itself is not a cosmic, uh, it's not a ritual that reenacts the creation of the world, so to speak. 
Um, there's a lot about masonry that's similar to what we see in religious tradition. Ritual, for example, the use of certain signs to, uh, 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 to denote certain characters or certain qualities that uh, we should aspire to. But it's not quite to the place uh, of being a religion as uh, where someone like Carl Jung or, or Joseph Campbell uh, might say. There's, to put it very simply, there's too much about it that's contrived. And when I, when I say that, I don't mean to disparage that at all because the contrivance is really beautiful in itself, uh, just the complexity of it. But it's not something that seems to have grown up organically. It was created at a particular time and place to address uh, symbolically and, and somewhat clandestinely um, uh, some of the injustices that they felt were going on um, in the world. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop and I, we're right at 7.38 and I'll stop the sharing and see if we can uh, answer some questions. And I, I certainly don't want to hear from anybody that you are completely lost because that is, <laughs> that's the last thing I want to hear. Uh, everybody stand by while I uh, promote everybody in attendance to uh, panelists so that you have access to cameras and mics. So starting with RML at the top of my list, I'm going to promote you to a panelist and then go down the list. So just bear with me. We lost one person who could not come up with any sound, and it appears that it's more likely local to that person's machine. Mm -hmm. Slowly. Now oh, here's a question and answer. Okay. Ah, uh, go go ahead, and uh, Dan and and respond. I'm still clicking away here. Uh, the question is, is there a myth? Is it's a difference between myth and legend? And yes, uh, legend sometimes has uh, a, a, a closer connection with historical fact. I know that seems crazy. Um, but myth does not necessarily have to have any historicity to it. Most myths happen in a time before time. We can have legends uh, of people. Well, for example, uh, Tom Osborne, you know, he's a legend, right? Uh, there has been some trans, uh, kind of a transcendent quality that has been attributed to him according, because of, you know, his many uh, uh, wins as a football coach uh, and his, uh, you know, just his character. He's, he's become legendary. I, I doubt that, and, and, and actually you may find this kind of fun, but I doubt that there's going to be a religion over time that's going to develop around Tom Osborne, <laughs> even though some would suggest one already has, you know. Um, but but legend seems to be much more localized, and myth tends to have universal qualities to it. Um, what I was kind of getting at: Does legend have kind of a positive connotation to where myth could go either? myth of a bad thing or myth of a good where you have like the Hiram legend, you seldom hear people say the Hiram myth, if you get what I'm saying. Exactly. Um, and this is why the word myth has come to be misunderstood in our, our culture. Uh, from an academic perspective, a, a myth is a much more universal uh, story, a narrative that draws on archetypal images whether it's the image of a mother and a child, the image of a stranger, the image of a shadow, or the image of a, uh, you know, the, the hero who goes on a journey. And there, there's a lot of these, but myths usually have these archetypal characters. And they, there is kind of this Venn diagram where they, they do overlap, uh, but myths tend to be much more universal. Uh, they can easily be confused. And so your question, uh, James, um, are we, con are we content then to just simply talk about a legend of, um, uh, of Hiram, of Biff here? Uh, it does carry with it some mythic qualities. It is a story that helps us to know 
who we are, that third degree, that master's degree, they call it a master's degree for a reason, you know? And this is when you receive further uh, light in masonry. Um, I don't know, would you like to respond to that? Uh, do you go by Jim or James? I think it's Jim. I respond to James, Jim, Jimmy, hey you, yeah. and all that. Yeah. Basically, I, I see your point. Anyhow, I, I do think that the, myth, the word myth should be used in some connotations, but our whole fraternity is built around, around like, do you place your trust in God? I mean, certain anchors, and then you come back to the unseen things that you have to kind of put implicit trust in. So I'm kind of torn yeah. back and forth. I try to strike an even balance. Well, you know, that, and that's what I think, why I think masonry is so interesting because you know, there are certain enlightenment thinkers uh, who just wanted to do away with God completely. You know, we, uh, there was a scientist, a French scientist named Laplace, who believed that, you know, if he knew mathematics well enough, he could, he could uh, predict the future. You know, if he just knew how matter and motion could all be uh, perceived and, and attributed mathematical qualities to it, uh, he could predict the future. And, and Napoleon, asked him, so, well, well, well where, where would God fit into that? And he said, I have no need for that hypothesis, right? Uh, God is no longer necessary in some enlightenment thinkers, right? But that's not true in masonry. God is the grand architect. It, it, it's a very, it's what's called deistic uh, uh, philosophy. God is the grand architect, like a watchmaker who puts this incredibly intricate watch together, winds it up, and human beings are given, you know, are created in the image of God by means of their reason, according to the enlightenment idea, and are able to understand God through creation itself. I can understand the architect through the architecture. Uh, I can understand the creator through creation. It, it's a nice, nice little balance. Um, it just like guys with like Sigmund Freud, for the life of me, I can't see him justifying masonry. <laughs> that sounds preposterous, but right it, now he he would call it some form of wish fulfillment, you know, of, of human beings wanting to achieve some sort of transcendent, you know, identity or something yeah. like that. Now Carl Jung, I I think he could see well. It's probably relevant, you know, and what you put in your heart and and your oh, actions. I think. So, hey, I, I don't know what Carl Jung has, has said about Freemasonry, but I don't uh, know either. I don't either. I think he would be fascinated by it. Yeah, I think, I think so too. By it. Anyhow, thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Oh boy, another question and answer. No? Well, if, if no one else, Jim, you and I can keep talking if you want. <laughs> I can't out debate somebody. I've done two Zooms today at 10 o'clock. I did a European Masonic Zoom. I was one of 64 and the presenter was from Spain. And he oh, was wow. he was talking about the, I can't even pronounce the word. It, it has the connotation from the Knights nice Templar of the 1300s, the Cisterian rule and the Benedictine rule and how they affected masonry. And that is a bit, even though I'm an eye Templar, that's a little bit above my head and all that. So I've had two Zooms, but yours was fantastic. So oh, that, that's yeah, I would love to have heard that. Yes, Ron. Yeah, uh, Dan, sorry. quick question, which or a question actually asking for a little bit more explanation of your discussion on signs and symbols. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, um, I, it, it's difficult. A, a sign is something that humans contrive and it can be completely arbitrary. Uh, how did we decide on an octagon that's red for a stop sign? We just kind of came up with it. We teach everybody, look, there's an octagon, it's red, it says stop. Whenever you see that, whether you're the Netherlands or, you know, you know that you're to stop. This is learned information, but we could very easily all of us agree one day, hey, let's just change that stop sign. And now we're all going to learn that a different colored uh, object is going to mean stop. And it's not gonna upset anybody to, to do that because we're just making an arbitrary decision. Well, today, now we're going to do, we're, we're going to 
uh, make this sign different. And if everybody has the right information, they will be able to you know, proceed with their life without any real problems. But take a symbol. What a symbol does is it basically, in, if I can use the word incarnates, makes incarnate, makes tangible an entire narrative, an entire philosophy. The American flag, when you see that, that flag, it stands for so much. It stands for a, an entire narrative about what it means to be free, what it means to, to have uh, freedom of speech, what it means uh, you know, to uh, be able to, to bear arms. We think about the constitution, all of that. All of that is encapsulated in that symbol. And so when that symbol comes to be challenged, it's not like you're challenging uh, uh, let's just change the stop sign. You know, nobody cares about that. But you are challenging a people's sense of identity because that flag gives them an understanding of who they are. And there are all kinds of symbols. There's a symbol of the cross. Well, another, a, another religious example. You've probably noticed that Roman Catholics uh, will often feature a crucifix, Jesus on the cross. Whereas Protestants will often just simply show a cross without Jesus on the cross. Um, whether we know it or not, there's a whole mythic structure that is tied up in those two symbols. symbols. Uh, they, they both deal with God's love in terms of you know, uh, Christ becoming incarnate. But Catholic theology is gonna want to emphasize the importance of the crucifixion of Jesus. Whereas Protestant theology is going to want to emphasize the resurrection. That's why there's the empty cross, right? They're, they're both symbols, uh, but the slight variation of the symbol has developed over time to mean slightly different things. So you can kind of tell a person's orienta orientation if you see they're wearing a crucifix or if they're wearing a cross, you know. Um, I don't know, Ron, do you want me to, to uh, elaborate more? <laughs> Or have I just muddied the waters? No, there's no more elaboration needed. I was just trying to get a, a better feel for the differences on that because, you know, I can see in, in some cases where a symbol becomes a sign. Yes. Can you? Can example, you the one that you gave with the cross, with Jesus no longer on the cross. Okay, yeah, right. that's a sign that he has risen. So I, it, I think there's, I think it's an overlapping thing between signs and symbols. I don't think you can knife switch between the two. Yeah, sometimes, uh, yeah, all symbols are signs. They signify some sort of information, but not all signs are symbols. I think that's a good way of putting it. So um, yeah, it's, it's very, very important. Um, any other comments or questions? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you think we should uh, kind of focus on signs and symbols and and just like uh, what comes to my mind is this Masonic square and compass. That's each of us knows what that means. But if you go to Joe Blow, my neighbor, who may not be a Mason, I know she's not because she's a yeah, she. Uh, but anyhow, I'm certain that she has an inward feeling, you know, of what that stands for, and I know what it stands for for me and all that. But right, we've got right. so many Masonic fraternities, and I've won my share, fair share of them. Do you think we we would be well behooved to kind of focus on one? I'm not saying abandon them, but focus on say the most meaningful symbol, you know, to convey our message to the world, if that makes sense. I'm not saying oh. abandon the double eagle or the cross of crown or the shrine emblem, but anyhow, you know, focus on the core. I, I think what uh, be saying in there is uh, many signs to certain folks are symbols to others. It's just really where where we draw that line that uh, it's a symbol to me. To other folks, it's just a sign. Yeah. yeah. Of course, some people can see some uh, Masonic uh, symbols don't even know what they are, like a keystone or whatever they might think. Well, sign of Philadelphia or whatever, or Pennsylvania. Yeah. So. But the reason that we know, we as Masons know what they are is because we know the story. Yeah. We know the narrative and we know the role that that symbol plays 
in the midst of the larger narrative. But, but I would say, um, Jim, getting back to your point, our narrative is very complex. And when you think of the 32 degrees in Scottish Rite, you know, in Scottish Rite Masonry, I mean, it goes all the way from the time of Solomon all the way up to the, you know, the 18th, 18th century, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of history and there's a lot of story that goes in there. And so I think what I'm hearing you say, Jim, is, is there a way that we can simplify that narrative? And, and I, I think there is, and I think we tend to emphasize that the third degree, the master's degree as being uh, so important. Hiram Abiff, a man of, of, of great character, a man who would not um, you know, forsake the master's word, even at uh, my, my, my life you can have, but my, uh, how's it go? I can't say it. Dignity never. But my, yeah, right. <laughs> My life you can have, but my dignity never. Um, you know, and, and the, of course his death, his, his unjust death, but his, his resurrection and the way that his, uh, you know, his character carries on. He, he's not literally resurrected, but we build a memorial to him, you know, that he will never be forgotten. Um, that's a real that's a real central narrative that I think, you know, whether in, you're in the Blue Lodge or if you're in uh, Scottish Rite Masonry, it's really like the linchpin that holds us all together. Yeah. Um, what what strikes me, I belong, I I'm on a courtesy list of so many uh, Masonic uh, Scottish Rite valleys, commanders, and all that. I'll give an example. Uh, the I get a publication from the Valley of Indianapolis, Indiana, Scottish Rite, and I don't know if it's that valley alone or the whole northern jurisdiction they changed the banner on the double eagle there's no more latin sm uh, spies mayo and dow s my hope is in god it, that banner just now says freemasons it oh, has wow. a has a 32 but they did away with that so it, it shows they're trying to focus on the core yeah, and, yeah. And when i told that's a 33rd degree friend of mine in alabama he almost had a meltdown well, see, but that meltdown is an indication that that sign is starting to take on more symbolic qualities, right? Yeah. Because that uh, shield was a reflection of what he understood to be the overarching transcendental myth that gave his whole life as an amazing meaning. And to take off uh, my hope is in God. Is that what they took off? Uh, from yeah. The yeah. Uh, that's paramount to, or very similar to what I was trying to say about what happens when you burn a flag, right? Mm -hmm. You are challenging and you are disgracing the entire narrative that gives my life meaning or one's life meaning. Yeah. yeah. So it didn't give me a meltdown, but it did raise my blood pressure a little. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this is another question that we, because whether we know it or not, mythology is still very important to human beings. And I think when we think about the history, or excuse me, the future of masonry, do we have a story that is going to attract the, or is going to um, incite or, or uh, titillate the imagination of, of younger people? You know, because the way that people get drawn in is by the story. Why do advertisers do what they do so well? Because they create little myths. And the symbol to be part of that myth is whatever that person's advertising. Hey, you want to have a wonderful Walt life? Just drink Budweiser beer. And, you know, the women are all going to be dancing on the beach and throwing, yeah. you know, <laughs> volleyballs everywhere. And, you know, that becomes the sacrament of this mythic, Budweiser beer narrative. I mean, the the uh, the advertisers do great things with myth, right? Mm -hmm. um, are we doing enough? Are we doing great things with myth? Uh, it's it's a really interesting question. I th think we tap into something that's somewhat universal, but we live in such an individualistic age anymore. I mean, everybody's. Have you ever thought about this? When I was a kid, there was a magazine called Life Magazine. And then 
a little further on, it became People Magazine. And then a little further on, it became Us Magazine. And then now it's just like Me Magazine. You know, I got my own Facebook page. Yeah. Know? Uh, it's so individualistic. Um, do we have the right story? Do we, do we have the right myth? So, um, any other comments? If, if we do not, Dan, um, there's a question I'm going to put in front of people because apparently we've had, um, I know of a couple of people who have been approached to join a Masonic organization that uh, maybe somebody here this evening knows more about than Dan and I, and that's the Masonic Rosicrucians. Does anybody like to tell us more about that organization? Well, I'm one. I'll be the guinea pig. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I better, I better uh, do that kind of gently. Uh, when I was about 12 years old, I used to get popular in mechanics and stuff, and, and I distinguish uh, one group of Rosicrucians from the Masonic Rosicrucians. Some people equate it to religion. There's a AMORC, that's a fancy uh, ac um, acronym, abbreviation for a group in California. The Masonic Rosicrucians, you have to have a belief in Jesus Christ, and it's kind of like showing you the, the mystical underpinning of masonry, to where kind of like what Dan was saying, you know, to where signs and symbols, how they correlate. There's a lot of secret stuff I can't get into. Uh, my uh, friend Micah belongs, as well as probably a few others, and I don't know if you have anything to say, Micah, but anyhow, it's kind of an ancient European base. It's based on a, a monk who was traveling to Jerusalem. Anyhow, he got diverted. Another monk who was traveling with him uh, got sick and died. He learned some sage wisdom, brought it back to Europe, and anyhow, he more or less died. His body was dormant for 120 years, and then then they had a manifesto in the 1600s, and basically that's where the so-called fraternity kind of gravitated from Germany toward France, and there seems to be kind of an interlocking between uh, Rosicrucianism, the legitimate part, what I call legitimate part, the masonry part, and possibly speculative Freemasonry. So I, I call that the real Rosicrucians as opposed to the ones that in California, I think they're uh, degree peddlers you sign up for a course pay a fee and up a degree you go and all that yeah. so that's yeah. probably not a good explanation anyhow micah if you're listening do you have anything to add yep. jim i couldn't put it any better i think you you described it well you're far more active than i am so i defer to you well i don't know if i need to be deferred to i'm just just a grateful to be a member so. in fact i got my dues card today Hmm. yeah there is that right <laughs> yeah there is that and i i paid foolishly till the year 2027 i wanted to lock in my dues so yeah okay well thank you that's helpful um do we have any other comments or questions uh richie in ins has his hand up I'm sorry, I'm not going to show you my pretty face because I was actually digging weeds in the garden when the webinar came on in my pocket iPhone. So I am a total mess right now. But I just want to say that uh, the way that you explain the uh, signs and symbols, that's that was a very good, uh, you know, very good way of doing it. I'm a sub, I'm a social studies teacher for ancient history, ancient civilizations. So this will actually help uh, when I start talking about all the different uh, civilizations that I'm doing with sixth graders. Right. And that's one of the things that they really get wrapped up around is, well, this symbol of this particular civilization, does it mean this? Does it mean that? You know, well, it was a sign. And, and uh, so it was very enlightening with your discussion while I was pulling weeds and getting muddy. But uh, yeah, thank you very much, Dan. That was, uh, it was very interesting. Sure, if you'd like to pursue it further, there's a theologian named Paul Tillich, T-I-L-L-I-C-H, uh, who really wrote a very, uh, very brief little essay, not more than five pages long, in a collection of essays called The Eternal Now. Uh, and it's probably on the internet, you could find it very easily. But sign and symbol, I think, is what the name of the essay is. Okay, I'll have to look into that. It, uh, 
this is going to help me out quite a bit when I when it comes to teaching uh, my classes. Oh, good. I'm glad for that. That's great. Uh, Richie's uh, presence tonight reminds me that uh, Richie, I think you're in Manhattan, Kansas, if I remember right. Right. Just just west of it, a little town called Ogden, but I work in Manhattan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Richie was at um, uh, my Blue Lodge meeting this last month, and he found out about the webinar. People will kind of assume in Blue Lodge that this is a Scottish Rite only uh, event. And I would ask everybody to go back to your Blue Lodge and let people know that these webinars are not just for Scottish Rite and that con, not con, force your, your secretaries to promote this. <laughs> your Blue Lodge secretary so that uh, we reach more people than just uh, uh, the number we have tonight and the numbers we've had in the past. Um, speaking of, oh, I wasn't really speaking of it. Anyway, next month, the July Lyceum presentation will be again by Tom Howder. If you were here last month, um, you heard his symbol or his um, presentation that uh, I think I want to try to incorporate it into Masonic education in a Blue Lodge, the method of, of um, hermeneutics, uh, interpretation of interpretations and interpretation, so forth. Yeah. Trying to dig into what, what the symbols mean to, um, to uh, Masons within the Blue Lodge. And of course you could use this in the, in the Scottish Rite Valley too. Anyway, uh, Tom's uh, presentation is entitled Masonry is, is a Progressive Science, the Concept of Continual Learning. And I remember one of the things that struck me most about, about um, something that Albert Pike said, and that was that one of our, our charges is to teach and learn. And uh, that's why I feel that the Scottish Rite is a good organization because it is a university of masonry and it's our duty to to teach or find somebody like Dan here who, who can teach. And I'll just sit here and smile. Um, but anyway, that is what's going on. But what I'd like to point out is we really don't want this. I said this before, but I don't. Dan and I don't want this to be the Dan and Tom show. And uh, <laughs> we, we have additional presentations that we can bring forward and they're good ones by either Dan uh, or Tom Howder, but um, we'd like to get a few more people involved. And I think, Armel, are you still here? Yeah, he's here. I think Micah once volunteered you to do a presentation uh, on Scottish history. Armel? Yep, I'm here. I, I don't have video. I still can't do it with my computer. But yes, Micah did talk to me about doing one on Scottish history and the Royal Order of Scotland and uh, the, uh, the French and et cetera. And so I would be glad to do that. How's August sound? Uh, I don't think that'll work. Wait a minute, just just give me a, a, just a couple of seconds. Let me check some. Okay. Well, we we can do this some other. Yes. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. put Armel on the spot right now. That's you know that's not good. Oh, put him on the spot. No, 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 no. I it, it, August would work. Okay. I needed I needed to look at the calendar. Well, August Very August good. would work. Say, I, I want to say before we leave, Richie, if you would like, if you ever want to give me a call and talk about how you're teaching this, I'd, I'd love to, to hear from you, you know, maybe talk things out. It'd be great. That'd be great. Uh, yeah, because I'm always looking for new ideas of teaching and with, with my years of experience of going into my third year of teaching pre-teens, which, uh, you know, I have pre-teen grandkids right now. So it's one of, one of those uh, challenges. And I actually started summer school this morning for uh uh math and and social uh math and language arts o m g i should have just stayed home stayed in the garden this summer but uh 
Yeah, it's yeah. going to be worthwhile. But yeah, I'm always looking for new ideas when it comes to teaching the ancient civilizations because most teachers and faculty that I work with, their idea of teaching social studies is, oh, you just read a book and give a test, right? <laughs> uh, no, there's more to it than that. And yeah. you know, if I can use any kind of help that I can get, especially from outside sources. Take them on a dig. I'll just say that. And we'll leave it after. We'll leave it to our conversation. <laughs> Turn yeah, I'll, hook up, I'll hook up with Don and, and he can give me the information. That'd be awesome. All right. Okay. Uh, Deputy Dan, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, not at this point. Uh, I'm working on uh, a lot of initiatives uh, within the Orient of Nebraska. And maybe uh, in a month or so, I would love to set aside five minutes for a quick update. Okay, sounds good. Please. Most worshipful Ron, how about you? Anything you'd like to offer for the good of masonry? No, not at this time. It's good to see you. Likewise, you take well, care. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Good to see Russ here, another most worshipful Russ Arena. My goodness, we have celebrities with us tonight. The only thing I will add for the good of the order, I just want to wish everybody a happy early Independence Day. It's coming right up, and I think that ties in with Dan's lecture tonight. So Right, yeah. Yeah, watch the like veterans when the flag passes by. You'll know that they're participating in some greater reality. We got to cherish this country while we have it. James, I'd like to tell you, thank you for calling it Independence Day. That That's, uh, I think we, uh, I my family for years has called it the 4th of July. Yeah. And the time I, I was a little fever, and I've, I've resolved to quit doing that and put the focus where, where it truly should be. Right. I'm trying to do the same thing. I got a calendar two feet away from me, and I thought, I better not say 4th of July, because we always have a 5th of July, 6th of July, but we don't always have an Independence Day from Great Britain. Right. So, thank you for that. Well, everyone, um, I wish you a safe, don't get burned holiday. Right. And um, with that, I will proceed to close. Dan? Deputy Dan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.